It is December the 16th, 2023, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. And we're back, three of us. It's 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 inching it's inching closer to oh. everyone going on holidays and visiting family and hiding in the forest and other things. All the, ex- all those sorts of things. Yes, I, I'm excited because I, I just received this. I had ordered it a while ago, and I'm just going to share it. it. Very little to do with photography, but what the? You, oh, ink, ink! I can see the, ink. the blackest oh, ink. The, the blackest what? The blackest print in the universe. <laughs> the blackest that, paint. Vanta black, paint. Vanta black, paint. Oh, paint. Oh, paint, not print. Sorry. This is even blacker than Vanta, evidently. Is right? it? Is and it? it is, blacker than black? Yeah, blacker than black. And um, it is... There you go. Um, it's Stuart Semple, who, who is uh, ah, one of these... Ah, okay. He's been Inver- railing again. Main adversary. <laughs> so what you're going to say? This is even That's blacker true. than Wednesday Adams playing painted black on her black cello. True, uh, true. <laughs> anyway, yeah, don't don't uh, put it on your car, otherwise you'll be in an accident within seconds. Yeah. I have to see <laughs> a photo of that black BMW. Okay. That, so that, that reminds me, Chris, of when I was a kid and I thought color blindness means that if something was a certain color, you would literally see Invisible. straight through it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you could just, mm, like, I might if have, you paint the door red, you could literally see straight through it. I might have gotten this wrong. Mm. Yeah. You, you, you might really, have, got, you you might really have gotten believe that. Wrong. that? <laughs> well, I don't know that I've believed it. It was just like, I don't think when I, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, a, yeah, a small kid, probably under 10 years old or something like that. But I thought if somebody's colorblind, if they can't see that color, what do they see instead? I tr- I because people to... didn't call it in, in this country. At least it was just called colorblindness yeah. right in those yeah. days. They, you, they didn't. Yeah. Reminds, um, reminds me of the time when I tried to explain to someone what orthochromatic film means because it doesn't see red. <laughs> and it was a similar situation. OK, yeah, what yeah. happens to the red then? Is it just. No, it's it's black. Anyway, photography. <laughs> it's photography. photography. Yes. It's it's the time of year when we are we are we're just throwing things in our document to talk about, and it's a it's a it's a rather unplanned episode. So we looked in the in the news bin, and um, I, I, and what I, did we find? <laughs> well, here, here's a few things that I found, and the first is um, I have a follow up to Harmon Phoenix. The, the new color film that we talked about that yeah, yeah. is getting quite some publicity and <clears throat> that has resulted in it not being available in Germany anymore. I think it's sold out. Um, it's I sold tried out to get everywhere. A, I tried to get some. Too. I tried to get a couple of rolls. They said like uh, two to four weeks, which means we haven't don't have it in we stock. We haven't got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> haven't one started thing, manufacturing it. Basically. One thing I, I realized only after a while, and I don't think Harman knows what an opportunity for for a promotion that is, is that, and, and I, only re- I only realized when I listened to the Sunny 16 episode about it, where the Harman people are, um, are, are as guests and they talk about this. They keep talking about this film being kind of difficult to scan, and it's 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 different, and it's like, <clears throat> and I wasn't sure what that really means. Is that a, a thing of the? Is, is the surface different of it? Does it reflect light in a weird way? <clears throat> Turns out, no, it's maskless, which means it doesn't have the orange mask that other color films typically have. So when you bring it to your corner store for scanning to your lab for scanning and they throw it into their a color negative scanning machine that'll mess it up because it'll try to re- re- remove an orange mask that's not there but there was a film by Rolai a few years ago that also didn't have this mask and it was specifically targeted towards people scanning at home because inverting a, an orange masked film is difficult. You need specific mm-hmm. software for it. And if you have a maskless film, it just means you shoot it, you invert it, or you scan it, you invert it, and that's it pretty much. So uh, this is, if, if they want to target a specific audience of home scanners, of people who might not even just scan it, might, they might just have a camera with a macro lens photographing it of a light table, of a, le- of a little LED light table or something, that makes it so much easier. And I don't think they have that on their radar. 
So that's very right. that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, I was going to go with um, it, it, it's a, a, a well kept secret actually. The 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 Harmon Lab because they do have their own lab that you can send your film to. Yes, is actually really good at color development. Um, you know, c- for a company that, of course, until right now has only ever made black and white film, um, uh, but their their lab for many years uh, has been able to process C forty one films because, of course, they had a black and white C forty one film, and, and they and, do have and they do have the machinery for it, and it's all set up to remove that orange mask. So they had a learning process for sure. So if you're in the UK listening to this and trying out the new film, then you could do an awful lot worse than sending your film to the Harman Lab for scanning. <laughs> Yes. So anyway, maskless. When when I realized that, I was like, "Oh, I have to." Now I have to buy it. So that triggered my what my, my click what finger. What do you think is going on? And I'm talking globally in terms of research for new film. I mean, we talk about you know the research on megapixel processors, speed of processing, um, lens design, all of that kind of stuff. But I rarely read, hear, or speak to anyone who knows uh, there's some very sophisticated new research into photosensitive film. Not aware of anything. Right. Um, you, no, no I mean, you, you occasionally get new de- emulsions in development, but that's not fundamentally I mean, changing the technology, though, is it? There's a, there's a, there has been a fundamental change in the whole film photography side because uh, there was there was a point where that was the standard and it had to be very precise and you were doing anything to get the best resolution the the, the smallest grain and so on and then digital happened and that took over that that uh, let's say surgical side of photography and that gave the whole film side the freedom to experiment and to be a more of a playground and to yeah. I don't know to love grain to love weird colors and these kind of things. Um, That's a really so good point. Yeah, I'm not I thought of it like that. I don't expect innovation on the film side. It's more like, hey, let's let's finally just not give a damn about the color accuracy of our C41. But on the other hand, it, one could not give a damn about color accuracy and yet create film that is specifically oriented, say, in a more exaggerated way to say what Agfa's color um, response to green or codachrome response to red in other words those subtle variations whether it's in overall contrast how it defines color um and i'm not saying that this is a broad market appeal issue but knowing you know that there are always uh purists in terms of remember when you know um lps went out of fashion you know what I mean? They were almost gone. And then artists started pressing their own. They bought old machines. And all of a sudden, with dance clubs, you had these limited editions. And now um, it's not unusual for a wax disc to outsell even CDs who are yep. on their way out. Um, so there is a niche market. I mean, look at the three of us. <laughs> we jump in and probably experiment with any kind of film, even if it was, you know, $25 uh, a roll, just because. We wouldn't buy 10 rolls, but we would buy one and carefully uh, photograph it, um, photograph from it. Um, I'm always curious about that vis a vis the kind of niche market and passionate. Um, purveyors of film photography writ large and the growing um i guess niche market in film cameras which you know it seems there's no there's no end in sight for those kinds of things to keep being manufactured even in a limited way i th- i think they are they're dusting off some of the old machinery as we speak so um well i hope so because because i do think that with our ability to use science, new technology for backing, just that kind of thing of, do you need a a colored backing or not? Uh, S-star or flat, what kind of new plastics or bamboo material that could be used and will that have kind of ancillary visual responses that are unusual? 
those are the kinds of things that I would certainly like to see. Oh, I mean, um, there is there is innovation there. I mean, when we look at materials, washi film, for example, film yeah. that is that is yeah. printed on uh, with the emulsion made put on paper. Yeah. Um, so I guess there is that innovation, and it's very likely not coming from the big ones. It's not from coming from Kodak. Or no, from I, and I don't I don't think it would. I mean, in no. the same way that instant pictures w was. You know, again, and, the purview and, of... And the reason is because they are kind of set in their ways. And though, for example, like Harman, I mean, they've been around forever. They are not seeing the maskless um, feature of that film as a feature. They see it as a hindrance to getting a good scan from the established old machines. So, yeah. Yeah, well, Chris, you, you use, uh, you know, four by five cameras and, re yeah. you know, a member of the old fantastic Polaroid back for them. Mm, you know, with I have Pilo one I, I don't have filmed for it. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, for a while, maybe about five, six years ago, could be more. Oh, New there 55 was, tried to, tried to exactly. cater to that market. I ordered a ton of it. <laughs> oh, I, I still have some in the fridge, but it's probably it's, yeah, dead by now. Too, so me too, me anyway. too. Um, but... Anyway, I look forward to that. It's a shout out for anybody who um, is listening or watching this. That that uh, please innovate. Let's have some interesting film. Yes. Um, you know, go for it. Not subtle changes, but something radically different. Anyway. All right. How how do we yeah. get to the next topic? Uh, I don't know. No I'll idea. just I'll just ask you. Hard yeah. cut. <laughs> who has been out it during the nights of the last couple of days to shoot the Geminids? weather here has been horrendous the last few days so you know, no you know we, we had the we had the okay a month ago we had the um what other meteor shower was that one of the Perse others is it the perseids Perse the i think one, the perseids were, yeah. were up a month ago and i completely forgot to tell people in the podcast i mean i only realized like a week later that we just missed it and uh, so I, I, at least on the on the Happy Shooting podcast, um, we prepared people for the Geminids, but everyone was like, there was a cloud cover everywhere. So it, didn't, <laughs> it did not work. It's the best meteor shower of the year. It's, I mean, they had people who could see it in like, I think in, in, in Canada, Saskatchewan, people got photos of it yeah. with like two or three um, shooting stars a minute. So Evidently, the whole of Northern Lights as well over this year and, and that, next yes. year um, yes. are, are going to be unlike uh, something nobody's ever seen. I, we've seen some recent pictures of the Northern Lights. They're just there was yeah one of those came through actually we haven't got a, a, a list for it I don't, a, a link for it but one of those came through my feed this week actually this year's um, northern lights or northern skies photography awards or something like that some some seriously seriously impressive yeah stuff. i mean i'm planning a, a trip to the arctic next october where canada uh no from norway uh, ah, doing it that up way. to svalbard yeah uh -huh. and then oh, in nice. across yeah Nice, nice. All right. Um, we do have an AI scandal in, in photography land. Not and it's, another one, surely. Oh, boy. And it's not, <laughs> it's, and it's not about uh, image generation. It's, it's a completely different one. Uh, B&H Photo was caught uh, publishing an AI-generated <laughs> guide written by someone who does not exist, including, including a whole bio of Alexandra Ibarra, who does not exist, and they were... Um, they were caught because they used, a, I think, an Adobe, an AI generated Adobe stock image for her. So, oh, okay. So it wasn't of the, because of the words then. That was kind of the stupidest way to get caught by just using some stock. It's got to be on purpose. This is BNH. They, they. I mean, you know, I, I know sometimes people's opinion on BNH varies, right? And I don't have a point of view to, uh, don't, um, on, on that at all. Um, but. They're pretty competent people, I think, aren't they? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah they know I what mean, they're doing. You know, <clears throat> when I was a professional photographer living in New York, uh, I frequented 47th Street Photo. If anyone remembers that from being in New York and being a photographer, it would be the holy grail that one would go to for all the latest and greatest. Eventually, that rotated into what became B&H Photo. 
and a B&H photo is just a massive, massive <laughs> organization. But they basically have everything that's available. Oh I mean, yeah, I've is... I've spent I've left I left some money there. I shaved <laughs> pieces of my credit card off and left it. There. Mm, I think I've done that too. Yeah. <sighs> oh yeah, and and for a while they issued their own kind of adjunct credit card. So no tax, no shipping, especially here in the US, which would be great. It would be easier for me to order my paper from them. I still do. than you know, across the street. Not that there is a paper seller across the street anymore. There used to be. Anyway, them, them using AI to write articles. Is that something we even need to talk about anymore? Because I felt the feeling that everyone is is doing that now. Would it, be well, more, would it not be more newsworthy if they weren't using AI to, to write <laughs> stuff? Like, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that, that you know, we have been talking about this for a while, but, but and not even that long. I mean, you think 18 months ago, this really wasn't on anybody's radar, but, but currently, I think the, the interesting... Ah, there's my siren. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I told you. Um, I think that what is interesting culturally is that you have a generation of people growing up who will either question the, quote, reality, um, or not question it and just accept it for what it is. I mean, my 10-year-old granddaughter, I, sh I was showing her a um, couple of, of kind of macro uh, pictures of, of bugs. And, um, and the first thing she asked is a 10-year-old, is that real or is that AI? Mm -hmm. Now, from a 10-year-old, and, and she didn't really think about it. It was just like she wanted to know, just the way we would want to know. It has now become, everything has become questionable as to authenticity. I, I think uh, uh, the, the younger generation these days is kind of automatically starting to develop a different radar Different antennae the too. I think you'd have to. Yeah, I think yeah. you have to. I, I'm, pretty, um, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure it will. It will mix things up for older people. It will be difficult for people who are kind of used to a media <laughs> landscape that is trustworthy. I'm making air quotes here, yeah. but um, but. <laughs> Well, or, or generated by people, made by people, um, reviewed by people, and so on. Well, that's funny you should mention that, because my thought on this was you, you've got this off Petapixel. I'm like, how long before Petapixel itself is an AI, and it's just writing AI articles oh, about it is AI probably articles already about AI And articles. being reviewed by AI it's, reviewers, so yeah. there's the meta of it. But I have a controversial question. Go ahead. Does it matter any more? I, don't, I think you can, I, I think there's a the, the answer to that is is not necessarily related entirely to AI for me um, because you know it, it could be applied to any shift in stuff right you know uh, be it technology or other things you know, the 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 new comes uh, and there will be people that embrace uh, embrace it and there'll be people that try and uh, reject it and there'll be people that even deny it and it'll happen anyway. <laughs> So, so I think the important thing is education. And there's awareness. also different kinds of writing out there. I mean, different functions for writing. There's the the utility kind of stuff that is just reporting on things, which is probably easier to automate than some Maybe. deep philosophical. And also, thing. remember, we have you know, uh, do we believe our news read and written by humans? for the most part, but do we believe the accuracy of them? Um, I, gu I guess the question is, um, and this is just a constant ex exploration as we kind of live through this interregnum, this kind of transit between believing our eyes, trusting our news sources, trusting what we read, to completely, um, it's not that we don't trust it, it's that what do we get out of it? I mean, my, my feeling in, in you know, I, I, I really bristle at the kind of these controversial questions about AI art versus, quote, real art. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
give me a it's, break. It's it, photography, in other words, it's photography versus painting again. It, 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 it ain't the tools. It, it's what what do you get out of it? If I read an amazing article written by AI and saw beautifully rendered imagery by AI and even read reviews that move me to that article, which I got a lot out of, would I really care? Mm. No. I, I don't think I would. What am I getting out of it? What is my response? How does it make me feel in the world? That's controversial, I think, at this point. Right. I, I think you're probably right, but I, I, you used the word interregnum, right? Which is, apart from being an excellent word just That's to a say, because it's, it's a great word just to speak. It's very satisfying. Um, it, I think is a, is a point very well made because... I think the the tools will swiftly come to a point. The technology will swiftly come to a point where actually, you know, not only is it absolutely commonplace, but there will be trust mechanisms for it. Maybe so. Yeah, the uh, you know it, the the security and the trust will evolve. It'll it'll lag behind the, the very front end because security and trust always does because you can't. It, it's difficult to it to create a trust model for something that doesn't exist yet. So, but it necessarily lags behind a little bit. But I think it is, and maybe it's maybe it is a generational thing. Maybe uh, it may, maybe the poor the poor old Gen Zs are, are, are the lost generation that have lost their whole of their youth to smartphones and, and AIs, and then they'll, but yeah, their their kids will be fine though because you know when when their kids yeah, will be past smartphones and will but will will have developed the trust models to deal with the new technologies. So it, it is. It's By a the shift. way, or not, but, or, or not. Well, I think we'll probably be in a bit of trouble if we don't. But <laughs> well, we're in trouble now. <laughs> oh, All yes. this has a lot to do with the future of photography too, because if there is a complete blurring of real and unreal, and no real accurate trust, and nobody wants to look at an image and go, "I must research this." It's just not going to happen. They're going to look at an image, they're going to respond, and then move on, generally speaking, if we're talking about news or whatever. I just think that that there will be an entire culture or a cultural evolution wherein we just take this data, we recognize that it could be real or not, we process it within our cultural boundaries, and then we move on. I'm not saying that this is a positive thing, but but it also could have benefits as well. We don't know what they are since we are, in fact, in an interregnum. All right. Speaking of not trusting your eyes, the next one. Um, this, this came around, I think, two weeks ago at least. Um, and I'm not even sure if we've talked about it here on the show, but it's this this photo that made a bit of a stir because it shows the same person. It's a photo of a bride from behind, and there are two mirrors. And it, th look at the po position of her hands in the two. <laughs> the, so so and why if she she is there? It's the same point in time, and there's uh, she's having her hands in different positions in all her three incarnations in this photo. So um, the mm. the story, I think, also brought a, a broke on Petapixel and it made a bit of a stir because, of course, how does that happen? And the person who shot that then said ah, it that they went to Apple and talked to a genius and the genius apparently told them that this was because the phone assembles the photos ai internal from multiple shots okay so that would have been my guess to be honest because you know, it, it, so well is it the, not that no it's not so ah. so the the thing is the the only way that i know of where you could have the same person in one photo in multiple different motion phases would be a panorama Right, because the panorama, you 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 okay. sweep the camera, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and with if you're smart, you can even have the same person in the shot multiple times because they run to the other side and stuff like that. So, um, because the, the the yes, the phone takes multiple photos. It takes ten photos and then takes the best bits and makes the photo out of it. Um, it does that, but it does that within two seconds, and it's very quick. And this this kind of thing does not happen. Um, I found myself trying to reproduce that with my iPhone on a on a tripod and waving my arms in front of a mirror. And do you um, still fit into your wedding dress, Chris? <laughs> not with a wedding dress, and it did not 
do anything. It was always the same thing. And uh, one of the reasons people didn't believe it was a panorama photo is because um, that person shared a screenshot from their uh, photo photos app with the in additional information opened. And there it was not indicated that it's a panoramic photo. So uh, someone, uh, some smart person went on to try it out <clears throat> and you can you can try this if you have an iphone do switch it to panorama mode and then just sweep the camera i don't know a little bit and it will not be a panorama it has to be a drastic difference in in aspect ratio for the phone to actually say oh yeah this is a panorama and sort it into the accordion you mean like a two three album. five instead of a no no even further what? even more even more like like a real wide oh. long sausage shaped photo that's what you need in order to um to make the iphone claim that it's a panoramic photo so that's interesting so it's not to do with the mode you've shot the mode it in that assigns that metadata tag it's actually to do with the aspect ratio of the image right. you make that assigns <clears throat> the metadata tag interesting okay, so mystery us. solved it's a panoramic photo um and it's it uh, that also kind of shows in the weird resolution that thing has it does not right, doesn't make okay. any sense if mm. it's not a panorama so hmm. this was the, and, and people really people it was it was all over the timelines and things and oh my god uh, computational photography is messing up our photos and is doing weird things and i have to say i missed that one but i'm still on is the dress blue or black or yellow and gold or whatever that dress was from about five years ago yeah about about at least five years ago <laughs> <laughs> i don't do a lot of social media chris it's right <laughs> all right um next up is uh ted talk that you put in our document and I happened to have watched yesterday. So Yeah, I think it's only um, been out about two days as we record yeah. this. So so you and I both got, obviously got this in a feed. So this, this is a really interesting TED Talk uh, because it speaks about the manufacturing supply chain for a lot of our modern technology and, and, and the, the ted talk itself focuses on ai technology but actually it's relevant to lots and lots and lots of different things that have chips in them and it relates to the taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company i think that's what tsmc stands for yes. um uh, very basic premise there are only three fab man you know, uh, fabs uh, co companies companies that can actually manufacture chips uh, uh, of uh, highly sophistication in the world uh, one is intel in the usa one is samsung uh, in korea and the other is tsmc in taiwan and the, the the ted talk is a geopolitical angle on this in the sense that that met there are many analysts who believe that that china is only really five five to ten but maybe only five years away from trying to invade taiwan and and yeah and annex it um and it was it the, the ted talk is about what would happen um if there was no tsmc and and they are by far the world leaders in the sophistication of chips they're the only ones that can make three nanometer chips etc etc yeah. uh so there's there, there's um uh there's, there's no great answer <laughs> <laughs> there's no light at the end of the tunnel on this one i'm afraid so it's not really a very christmasy story uh, so, but so pretty much if anything happens there a tsmc will not be able to make the world's important big high-tech chips and that will have uh an influence on everything yes yeah. Because so so I mean many of our listeners and viewers will know names like Nvidia, of course, in in the world of GPUs uh, and uh, you know, and GPUs being the things that power your AI. <laughs> but Nvidia don't manufacture their chips; they outsource that to TSMC, and so yes. does practically everybody else. Yes. So it's a really interesting one. We could see the re the the resurrection, I get like, uh, the phoenix from the ashes of Intel, um, because the the American um, government, I think, uh, Jeremiah, correct me if I'm wrong, but your federal government as uh, uh, is backing masses of investment in oh, Intel to manufacture in Germany as well. Germany, yeah. uh, Intel is building a big uh, chip factory in Germany. Yeah, right it's now, become so. a national security issue here, yes. um, like oil. And um, it's kind of that drill, baby, drill concept, but they could actually make it. Um, it's it's significant because, first of all, there's you know a lot of nuance in the geopolitical 
vis-a-vis -vis China, Taiwan, because there is the mutual assured destruction aspect of the Chinese uh, cutting off chips from the U.S., which would be like cutting off their nose despite their face. There's just so much interactive stuff. However, if things get crazy and people act crazy, then crazy things will happen, as we have seen and are continuing to see. So um, I think, uh, you know, Apple's move to silicon-based chip, the, you know, now the M3, and I'm sure they're working on the M5 now, whatever that will be eventually. Um, certainly Intel, um, Qualcomm is... All of these chip manufacturers are trying to get at least a leg up on manufacturing. Unfortunately, it takes at least five years to build these plants. These are yeah. the most sophisticated manufacturing plants and, and, in the yeah. world right now. And billion, tens of billions, if not a hundred billion. I think the, the, the video quoted something like a hundred billion dollar investment by TSMC in the next generation of chips. Oh, the, the, um, easy. Oh, yeah. Uh, because and, they and, could justify it. But no, a hundred billion dollars. And that's not... Well, that's, that's not just the manufacturing it, capability. That's not even the design element of it because well, well, I mean, you mentioned Imagine, Qualcomm, Jeremiah. Qualcomm, of course, very famous chip manufacturer. Except they don't actually manufacture chips. They design right. them. That's Apple right. design them. Qualcomm design yeah, them. Right. Lots yeah. of other people design chips, but really there's only very few I, that can manufacture them. And I you just certainly recently, don't want to hear when you've built your plant and you run your first test, you don't want somebody to say, whoops. <laughs> I, I just recently, hmm. I just recently uh, listened to a podcast where someone talked about the machines that make these chips. Um, these are machines that themselves are made of four hundred or five hundred thousand parts. So, even even that, the the quality of these machines has to be so high because, of course, you can't afford to have one of these four hundred thousand parts to fail every three months. Because if you if you multiply that by the amount of parts, the machine will never run. So you have to have these are in exceedingly expensive and high quality. And anyway, um, Seems yeah, TSMC. to be more sophisticated than than space flight. I mean, maybe really our wouldn't. maybe our whole AI revolution is not going to happen because of um, that single point of failure. And then there's quantum. <laughs> not yet there isn't <laughs> <laughs> that we know of <laughs> all right um let's move on to the next one uh adrian yeah this one's interesting this is my more positive contribution to our show today because that one was a bit doom and gloom um this is uh, i don't know if either of you are big fans of e-ink displays uh, yeah, I've uh, used a few, beyond, yes. Beyond a simple Kindle, right? So I think many, many of our listeners will have experienced a Kindle of some sort. But actually, the world of e-ink displays is is really maturing very quickly at the moment. And uh, so, you know, what I, what I bring you right now uh, in this link, here's another YouTube. This is a review um, from a, a, a British fella who has a YouTube channel that um, very much focuses on reviews of e-ink displays. Uh, the product itself, this particular one, is called the Onyx Books Tab Mini C. And it is an Android tablet uh, with a color e-ink screen. <laughs> yes, actual color. Uh, and uh, it is mi a little bit bigger than your, your average small Kindle. Um, they do make bigger ones as well, but yeah, they're, they're, they're getting smaller. Now, this, this is... Um, so... You can even watch video on this. It's what? sort of a great video experience, um, but e you can watch and video. video. Yes, you can. They, they have different speed modes, right? So that for for refreshing the screen and things like that, and you can that you can have one that's fast enough to sort of watch you know video on. All you right. wouldn't want to. You wouldn't choose to. Um, and the color thing is is new, uh, newish, um, uh, and maturing quickly. So you get three hundred dots per inch on the black and white on a, a device like this at the moment is the state of the art and for color 150 dots per inch but i think you only get about 20 colors <laughs> so it's, it's you, color color ish well it's color, color, it's color blind right it's, it's color it, maybe blind. it's cut co it's color right so it is color and uh, that makes a big difference to if you're downloading apps from the google play store because it has access to a full suite of android applications so it's not a locked down thing like a kindle where you can only read books on it you can actually use it as a full-on tablet 
Yeah, uh, I and uh, and of yeah, course, so, e-ink displays are very power um, light on on power consumption. So the displays are yes, absolutely. Uh, the and now that these things are starting to be used for more things, actually, one of the things that has happened with these tablets, the fully functional Android tablets, is that the the power consumption is much greater. So those of us are used to having a Kindle right. where it, it it literally doesn't use any. Uh, any electricity uh if you unless you're turning the page and it has to refresh the screen these things of course have you know processes going on in the background like your phone would right so so they do chunk through the battery a bit a, a lot quicker than a, than a kindle would um uh but just i just wanted to to raise the awareness of it really just in case anybody is um yeah, you know, is interested in these things having a bit of a play is the, um, and, is, is the display good enough for photography uh, I think it depends on what I you mean, do. Resolution so if, wise, 150 so, DPI is just fine. So resolution, resolution wise, not for color photography. Only 20 colors is not, uh, ah, you know, okay. and it's not exactly particularly color accurate. Um, Maybe a the, new the, art form emerging there. Exactly. Well, it, indeed, I mean, it's it's a new medium, right? It's well, a new display question. medium. Is it an expensive piece of kit, or is it? In other words, what would get me to either replace my iPad or have something on my desk which was like a notepad with tactile writing. I mean, because I, like, I make notes all the time on paper. And I so there, there's and a I, lot of right. those now. Um, and they have um, the, the technology that this company and others use, it's not exclusive, um, is the Wacom technology. Yeah. So yeah, um, it is. Um, it is supposedly. I've not had a chance to try one yet myself, but it's supposedly a very good feel for note taking, sketching, you know, all of that sort of thing because it's got that you know that Wacom technology in it, which is you know world leading, isn't it? Let's face it, right? In terms of you know the sensitivity of of, of these things. So it can be very good for that. It can be, there are different brands of these products that some of them specialize in note taking, others specialize in giving you access to different apps, others specialize in reading and stuff like that. But you can get one of these things. If you have a whole bunch of stuff on your Kindle, you can download the Kindle app for Android and you can get all of the, you know, just like using you know, a Kindle app on your phone or iPad. Um, so there's, there, there's lots and lots of choice. So if note taking and sketching is your thing, Jeremiah, yeah, there's absolutely a device manufacturer that will give you a really good experience. Yeah, the, in that the real question is, is it worth the dough? That's really the big question. In other words, having another device, another device to charge, another device that I always feel if you're going to introduce another device, have it do one thing phenomenally well, better than all the other devices it's a, it's a really good there. point um i think um it i think it depends on your use case right um and it depends on where you're headed so uh i i spent somebody as somebody who spends way too much time in front of screens this has a real appeal to me not just mm. as because i love my kindle and i read on my kindle but Kindle is not a good operating system for things like reading articles. Not really, right? You, it's clunky to transfer something and blah, blah, blah. So if you have something where you could get an app with your RSS feed on it, right, but it's still an e-ink screen, uh, or you could you, know, you could browse the web in a proper way and, and, and read things there, I think there's, there's definitely a use case there. But Sounds if like really what you want to me. do is watch and edit video, then no, these are not the devices for you. Sounds like an iPad. Uh, it, it, it's 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 a very strong that's a very strong argument and i think you you need to want the technology difference in the screen for whatever yeah. good reason well, right that's to, what I mean. to rest your eyes a, a larger piece of you know uh, electronic paper with beautiful tactile touch a great pen something that could trans translate directly to a computer screen if you mm. want to that would be helpful just as a note-taking device sketching all so the you can get those up to about a4 size yeah but they're days. expensive they are yeah the smaller ones are anyway, a bit cheaper but here's the thing here's the thing christmas is on on the <laughs> is, is coming up if That's anyone it. out there is getting one of these for christmas we're talking about the onyx books um hey let us know yeah yeah do yeah That'd be really interesting to hear of it from anybody like who, first who's got first-hand first experience of it. Yeah, That's definitely. Right. All right. 
Let's do a quick lightning round through our picks of the week. Um, I have brought us... Okay, so the 2009 to 2016 was the time when Digital Ref TV um, brought, years. Hmm? Brought, brought forward uh, Kai Wong and Lok Cheng, who are now independent uh, video producers and... These guys, nerdy, um, irreverent, very no respect for anything. They were doing weird tests. They they got professional photographers on the thing and gave them Barbie cameras to take pictures with, and um, they they destroyed cameras to find out how much they could take, and they did it in a very um, well in a very interesting way. And yeah, golden years, as you said. So um, these two guys are not in Hong Kong any longer. They are in the UK and they are independently doing their stuff, but also they have an, uh, a show called Bogey, Bro Bogey Brothers. And in that show, they d revealed that the old Digital Ref TV videos that they produced back then um, are gone. They've been taken off the YouTubes, but they, of course, have a copy of them, so they are in their latest episode. They're going through a few of them. They're reviewing a few of them, um, and I found it a delightful episode. So if you if you've, uh, if you remember the good old times when they painted some cameras in pink, like they, they painted a Leica yeah, yeah. pink. No? So that's the kind <laughs> of stuff they did. Um <laughs> Um, what are the what are the auspices under which YouTube removes videos? No, no, YouTube didn't remove it. The owner, Digital Ref, uh, oh. the 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 dealer who they worked for back then, oh, um, removed it. Digital so. Rev was a, I think it was a shop, but there was, was also, it, was a, yeah. it was a camera store in Hong Kong and they had a big, uh, they, they were quite a, a big website at the time as well, a, a, yes. an online vendor at the time. Anyway, two personalities of the photography, of the digital photography, um, early, early professional digital photography side. Um, I found it kind of fun to watch them watch their old videos. So um, We'll put a link in the show notes. And the second one is by Adrian. Oh, yeah, this is this is a good one. Actually, I found this on the amateur photographer website. Uh, 12 Christmas photography project ideas to try. But these are not your average photographer. This is not go out and I shoot see, all the letters of the alphabet Pringles somewhere can. or anything <laughs> like that. They, these are these are like DIY photo things. So, so, yeah, well, the Pringles cam one is is, is make a macro lens um, uh, or an extension tube, I think they call it. So, yeah, yeah so taking a Pringles can and, and, you know, making it light tight and attaching like it to it. your camera. Um, making a homemade bean bag with a bag of rice just was a of bit of, and, and wrapping it up in some cloth was just just a bit of fun. Um, and the, the, there's other things like you know drill it, drilling holes in in clips and mounting your know, ball heads to them to make you know clippable tripod heads. Just just a a, a bunch of fun stuff. Really. That looks like real fun. Uh, it, it is. Yeah, anything you can. Anytime a you can bottle get, cap uh, camera mount. Yay. Yeah, it's that's right. Yeah, just get a drill, yeah, drill, drill a drill a hole, you know, mount mount a quarter inch thread in it, and and away you go. So, <laughs> it, cool. it it just seemed to me that actually it could be quite quite good fun to have yeah a bit of a DIY project, and, and you it don't doesn't, won't, doesn't there's look to like you from. need a lot of stuff, right? It, no, none of it's expensive either. Stuff, yeah. It's stuff you find you know uh, around the place. Um, yeah, so it's not. It really isn't hard to do. Um, uh, this one's funny. Actually, stop there, Chris, just for a moment, right? So this is getting a kitchen egg timer type thing, right? One that has a, a, a rotary, you know, physical rotary interface, and, and using that to using that to make um, a, a panoramic camera, you know, like one of these devices that spins around and oh, takes so a time lapse kind of yeah, a time lapse cool. thing, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. So I have a kitchen timer. So uh, it just just lots and lots of fun stuff. A movie um, grip made from some pipe. Made from just bits of pipe that you can yeah. buy down the hardware store. It's just it, it, it's it's just this is cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's so just a bit of fun. <laughs> if, you, if you want to build some photography stuff with your kids back home, that's the place to go. All right. And then Jeremiah, you brought us uh, uh, yeah, stills.com. This, is, this is um a you know a site that uh, you know, it's a stock photo site, um, 
but the quality of the imagery is unusually good. Um, and the filtration system in terms of, you know, drilling down, you could follow artists, kinds of images, but they're, they're not the kind of imagery that one sees certainly in American television for pharmaceutical companies of people having a great time <laughs> walking on the beach, <laughs> you know, playing with their kids. No, this, these look like, um, these look like, this looks like serious art, art photography like art, yes. and they're licensable. And, um, I, I just, I came across it and I thought this is really, really where stock photography really should be if it's going to compete at all with um, AI over the next few years because I think um, AI stock quote photography unquote is going to really put a dent in the the uptake of oh, yeah. traditional stock agencies. Definitely. I like that idea. And I like the photos as well. That's yeah, they're some good they're stuff. Beautiful. Immediate, um, immediately visible that that is a different kind of stock photography. Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I, I haven't seen much press on it. I haven't really um, had anybody in my kind of extended community even aware of it. And so hopefully... No, um, it's the first time I'm, the I'm hearing of it, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Very nice. Thanks for sharing that one. Uh, links are in the show notes, of course, to everything that we talked about. Um, the the Phoenix thing, the Geminids. Is it Geminids? Geminides? Geminids? Gemini Geminids, I think. Geminids. Anyway, so uh. <laughs> that was it for this week on the future of photography. We're, we're going to try to squeeze in one more episode before the holidays. Um it's going to be a good one if we do it. <coughs> if, if we, if we do it, it's going to be a good one. If we don't do it, then we'll... It's uh, not going to be a good one if we we'll don't do deliver it. it after the fact. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, of course, at thefuturephotography.com. You can find us on the, on the socials. I'm not sure what socials we're on. But anyway, come join us and we'll be back very soon. Until then, everyone, take care. And bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.